Hello there. Father Bob, thank you for that gracious introduction. Uh, listen, I am delighted and honored to be here tonight. I always cherish the opportunity to speak to priests because it gives me the opportunity to deliver to all the priests in the room a very simple two-word message. These are two words that I suspect most of you do not hear nearly often enough. And those two words are, thank you. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you for what you are doing. Thank you for what I know you will continue to do. Priests are among the unsung heroes of our time, and you deserve every last measure uh, of our affection and our support. Uh, and, and listen, uh, I want to say thank you, not just on behalf of the people in this room, and for that matter, not just on behalf of the Catholics in the Archdiocese of Boston. I want to say thank you on behalf of untold legions of Catholics around the world I have met over the last 20 years, who I know carry in their heart a deep love for priests, but who will never have the opportunity to do what I'm doing here tonight, which is stand in front of you and speak to you. And so on behalf of all of those people, please hear me from the bottom of not only my heart, but the bottom of every faithful Catholic out there. Thank you. Thank you for who you are, and thank you for what you do. By the way, for those of you whose jobs compel you to do a lot of public speaking, I really recommend this to you as a rhetorical strategy. Always start by flattering your audience. <laughs> and if you do that, you can usually get away with murder. And we'll, we'll test that theory in a moment. Uh, but first, one other thing I want to say at the beginning. Uh, when I first got this invitation, uh, this struck me as one of the more puzzling speaking invitations I have received in, in a while. Uh, in that it was explained to me that I was being asked to come in and talk to you about Pope Francis. Now, you know, that's fine, that's kind of my shtick, uh, but the, the truth of it is that there is someone in this room, for that matter, there is someone on the program here tonight who has a much more plausible claim than I do to some kind of unique insight uh, into this Pope, and that, of course, is Cardinal O'Malley. But, yeah. But then the more I thought about it, the more the logic of the invite became clear, because I realized, you know, you can't have O'Malley, you know, keynoting every event in the Archdiocese of Boston, right? I mean, it's a little bit like food. Chateaubriand is great, but you can't have it every meal. You know, once in a while you have to settle for a Big Mac, right? Uh, and so, ladies and gentlemen, that is my role here tonight. I am playing the role of the Big Mac to Cardinal O'Malley's Chateaubriand. So all I can say to you is, bon appetit, just don't expect too much. Okay? Now, uh, at this stage, I've got about eight minutes left to try to summarize for you uh, the agenda of Pope Francis and where he is going to take the Catholic Church. But I think I can actually do it for you in 20 seconds. Okay, so someone time me. Here we go. The summary is the Doma Santa Marta, Lampedusa, and Saints Elizabeth and Zechariah Parish. Now, just in case those references are not immediately obvious to everyone in the room, let me briefly unpack each. The Doma Santa Marta is, of course, the, the residence on Vatican grounds where the Holy Father has chosen to live uh, instead of the papal apartments. And that decision was part of a cluster of gestures early in his papacy, in the days immediately after his election, gestures of personal humility and simplicity that sort of captured the imagination of the world. Uh, so uh, in addition to the decision to live in the Doma Santa Marta, we saw uh, the new pope immediately after the election, when the cardinals were leaving the Sistine Chapel, Rather than getting into the chauffeur-driven Mercedes papal limousine, he hopped onto the shuttle bus with the other cardinals like one of the fellas. Uh, we saw the new pope going back to the Casa del Claro in Rome. That's the residence he had been staying in before the conclave uh, in order to pack his own bag and pay his own bill. For that matter, we saw the new pope the day after his election calling his newspaper delivery guy in Buenos Aires to say, hey, I'm not going to be coming back. Can you please cancel my subscription? 
And by the way, if I am Mario Poli, the new Archbishop of Buenos Aires, I'm a little ticked off by that because now I have to go through the rigmarole of getting the paper started again. It's kind of a pain in the neck, but symbolically it was brilliant. Now look, I mean, all of that arose naturally from the personality of Jorge Mario Bergoglio. That simply is who the man is. But it was also, I think, calculated, deliberately so, to try to set a standard for what leadership in the Catholic Church looks like. Okay, I think what Pope Francis wants to achieve is a kind of Copernican revolution in perceptions, where when people look at the symbols of authority in the Catholic Church, when they look at the Roman collars that priests wear, when they look at the pectoral crosses that bishops wear, Francis wants them to think not automatically in terms of power and privilege, but rather he wants them to think instinctively in terms of service. This is a pope who has said that what the church needs is shepherds who carry the smell of their sheep because they are close to the ordinary people they are called to serve. And so this idea of leadership as service is therefore one of the pillars of this pope's agenda for the church in his time. All right, secondly, Lampedusa. Lampedusa is an island in the southern Mediterranean, uh, which is where impoverished migrants from Africa and the Middle East who are trying to reach Europe, it is their primary point of arrival, over the last two decades, some 20,000 of these people have died trying to make the crossing across the Mediterranean. On the 8th of July, 2013, Pope Francis made his first trip outside of Rome, and therefore the programmatic, tone-setting debut journey of this pope. He made it to Lampedusa in order to stand in that space to lay a wreath in the sea commemorating these people who have died and to condemn what he called a globalization of indifference to the poor. This is a pope, ladies and gentlemen, who has a deeply missionary conception of the church, one of whose stock phrases is the importance of the church getting out of the sacristy and into the streets, out of the sacristy and into the streets, meeting real people where they live. And, and within that missionary conception uh, of the role of the church in our time, I believe he sees the social teaching of the Catholic Church, and in particular, outreach to those who stand at the margins as the cutting edge of what it means to be a missionary church. So the second pillar, therefore, of the Francis agenda would be this deeply missionary, conception of the church with concern for the most vulnerable, the most forgotten, the most marginalized as the heart of what that mission means. Finally, Saints Elizabeth and Zechariah Parish. Uh, as you all know, uh, the Pope is not only the governor of the Universal Church, he is also the Bishop of Rome. And one thing that bishops of Rome try to do uh, is they try to get around to visit parishes in Rome. Uh, Pope Francis has made seven of these parish, uh, parish visits to date. His first was on the 21st of May, 2013. He went out to Saints Elizabeth and Zechariah Parish, which is located in Aor. It's a working class neighborhood of Rome, about 30 miles outside of the city center. Francis got there about 45 minutes before his scheduled start time that day. Uh, and when he got out of the papal helicopter, he told the startled pastor that in addition to saying mass and meeting with the people, he would also like to hear some confessions. Now, you have to understand, this was not part of the program, okay? So the pastor ran and grabbed eight people basically at random <laughs> and told them, you're going to confession. It's kind of a cute story. I, I was there, I saw this happen. These people said, well, Father, that's very sweet, but we don't want to lose our spot in line to see the Pope. <laughs> to which he responded, oh, trust me, you're going to see the Pope. <laughs> and then he brought them into the church. One by one, the Pope sat there, listened to their sins, and then administered God's forgiveness. Now, in part, this was Francis just trying to be a good bishop of Rome, but in part, 
it was important to him that the world see the Holy Father make a point of celebrating the church's premier rite of mercy. Mercy, ladies and gentlemen, is the spiritual cornerstone of this papacy. Mercy is quite literally this pope's motto, miserando atque eligendo, which is a kind of complicated Latin phrase that comes from a homily of the venerable bead, but what it basically means is choosing through the eyes of mercy. Mercy is in virtually every talk he gives. I think if you did a textual study of every word that has flowed from Pope Francis's mouth in the nearly 18 months since he was elected, you would find that the most common noun he invokes over and over and over again is mercy. This is a pope who has described his entire papacy as a kairos of mercy, a kairos using that evocative Greek New Testament term that means a privileged moment in God's plan of salvation. I think from the nitty gritty details of what do you do about the Vatican Bank all the way up to complicated questions like what do we do about divorced and remarried Catholics and what, do, what, what should our line be with Syria or Ukraine and all the kinds of decisions that a pope has to make. At the end of the day, what he wants is that when the outside world looks at the Catholic Church, they will see a community of mercy, a community that is not simply committed to mercy at the level of lip service, <clears throat> but that genuinely practices it in terms of its internal life. If you get a handle on these three things, that is leadership as service, a deeply missionary conception of the church, and mercy as the spiritual cornerstone, you will be in a position to understand virtually everything you are seeing and hearing from this poem. All right, last thing before I'm done. I want to take just a brief word uh, to say something about the project I'm involved in at the Boston Globe, which is Crux, this new site uh, devoted to Catholic coverage. Now look, the target audience for Crux is national and international. We are not primarily covering the Boston scene. That is, <clears throat> but that said, I mean, we were, of course, born here in Boston, and therefore your support uh, is particularly important. Let me tell you this. I can guarantee you that my colleagues in the journalism business right now are looking at this enterprise, that is Crux, as a great laboratory experiment. If it works, they will draw the conclusion that there is a market for serious, sustained, intelligent coverage of the Catholic Church. If it does not work, then they will conclude that there is no market for this and they will simply go back to business as usual. Uh, and so what I want to appeal for tonight uh, is not your money. I mean, you've had enough of that tonight already. We're not going to take up a second collection, all right? <laughs> what, what I am here to appeal for tonight are your eyeballs, okay? Because in the digital world, Eyeballs were the coin of the realm. Traffic on our website determines how much we can charge for ads, how, how many sponsors we get, and so forth and so on. If you believe that serious, regular, intelligent coverage of the Catholic Church is important, that that is a journalistic enterprise worth supporting, then please come on our website, which is www.cruxnow. Dot com. That's www.cruxnow.com and spend some time there. I guarantee you, no matter what kind of Catholic you are, you will find some things to delight you and some things that drive you absolutely nuts. Uh, that is part of the point. We want to include all voices. But at a bare minimum, we are an example of how a, a major secular news outlet in the United States can devote serious attention to the Catholic Church. And if you believe, as I do, that that is something worth supporting, that I would invite you to come along with us for the journey. Yeah. So folks, that's all I've got for you tonight. Let me end by saying, again, to all the priests in the room, heartfelt, sincere, thanks for your, your fidelity, your service, your ministry. You will never know how appreciated and beloved you are uh, by Catholics in the grassroots. Cardinal O'Malley, to you, ad multos annos. Thank you for everything you do, not just for the Archdiocese of Boston, but for the church in the United States and the church in the world. You are a beacon of light 
uh, and thank you for your service and your contributions. Uh, and then finally, God bless all of you. God bless the Archdiocese of Boston. And ladies and gentlemen, viva il Papa. Thank you and good night.